I'm delighted to be here. Um, and as Kevin emphasized, I'm really glad to have the opportunity not just to talk with you, but to take questions. Uh, the whole reason I'm here is to hear from the marketplace about what you all are seeing on the day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's what I want to learn this morning. So hopefully we'll have a conversation and we'll have a chance to hear from the audience. Absolutely. Send in your questions and, and uh, we'll try to answer them um, toward the end of our, of our Q&A here, our fireside chat. Um, I'm going to start, um, I was going to start with a softball, going with the, the analogies, but I think I'm actually going to start with what I think this group of folks want to hear most, and that's talking about fiduciary duty and, and uh, the standard of conduct rulemaking package. Um, just to level set, as everyone knows, last year the commission uh, issued a proposal of three um, separate pieces, but that work together. Regulation BI would uh, raise the standard of conduct for uh, broker-dealers. Um, they would also uh, propose a form CRS relationship summary that everyone, investment advisors and broker-dealers, uh, would have to give their retail clients. They proposed a uh, interpretation uh, to clarify or confirm parts of the uh, investment advisor's uh, fiduciary duty, as well as uh, ask questions about three um, extra broker-dealer type rules that could be uh, imposed on investment advisors, uh, account statements, uh, net capital and uh, financial responsibility rules, um, and uh, continuing education and, and licensing. The package is intended to um, ensure that all financial professionals um, don't put their own interests ahead of their clients, and I think we all uh, can get behind that, uh, that goal and intent. Uh, but uh, Commissioner Yu at the, at the open meeting said you could not support the package as proposed. Um, would love to, to get your views on where we are now with respect to the conversation around regulation and best interest. Some people are saying um, it should be called a fiduciary duty. Some people are saying um, what was not in the proposal, we should ban certain practices. Mm -hmm. Where do you think things are? So um, a couple of, of details there. First, regulation best interest, as Karen says, she's got it right on the nose, is designed to make clear to the marketplace what has been clear in this room for a very long time, which is that when uh, you deal with an American investor, you have to put their interest before your own. Um, and as simple as that principle sounds, uh, over the years, I think we have gotten evidence that um, some broker-dealers don't view it that way and that some investors don't understand what the obligations are of the people they're dealing with. So that was what the package was designed to achieve. Um, and I voted for the proposed rule, um, but as Karen says, I made very clear that I couldn't support it as a final rule. Um, and I want to say why. Um, for me, what's very important when um, thinking about making rules in this area is that whatever we do, we do it on the basis of evidence. That is, we understand how investors process the information we're giving them and whether they really understand um, what, uh, what we're telling them. And for me, one of the things that was very troubling about the proposal was that our economic analysis was really, and I said this in, the, in, the, uh, in, in my statement at the open meeting, was not a serious attempt to understand um, the effects of the rule. And, and let me just say a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, whatever you think about the Department of Labor's rule, and, and I understand that you know, people have strong views about that, for the better part of three or four years, they collected a massive amount of data and evidence about the way people respond to the idea, the way American investors respond to the idea that somebody owes uh, them an obligation. And the way they respond, for example, to ideas like fiduciary or best interest. And for everybody in this room who deals with concepts like that or understands them on a regular basis, I don't need to tell you that not every American investor understands them with the depth that we do. And that's a really important thing to grapple with as a regulator. Um, and we just didn't grapple with it. We also didn't take, make any serious attempt to try and assess the costs and benefits for investors of getting conflicted advice. So to the degree that someone has a conflict, and by the way, there are conflicts all over our economy. Um, investment advice is not special in this way. Um, you know, everything we buy, if you deal with a car salesman, that person has a conflict. Um, it's not that Americans don't understand a conflict, it's that they need to be informed about the way that person gets compensated, for example. Um, my sense is that the cost of conflicted advice are high but hard to measure, 
And we should try to understand them before we make big sweeping changes in rules of this area. Um, so I, I objected on that basis and said, look, we need, to, we need to get more evidence on the subject. We've done some work in that respect. The RAND Corporation uh, conducted a study for us. Um, there's some interesting evidence in that study. I think it's worth looking at. IAA has done some really, really good work on evaluating what we learned from the study and the limits of what we know from that study. Uh, but for me, the proposal just didn't grapple with that question. And I'm not prepared to vote for massive changes to the investment advice landscape without understanding whether an ordinary American investor is going to understand what we mean when we give them a disclosure. I want to say one more thing about that. I'm happy to talk more about the details. But something else that happened in that proposal that really troubled me is there are some compensation practices on the broker-dealer side that really don't make much sense. And most significant market players don't use them anymore. Um, sales contests, vacations, if you pitch a certain product. Um, you know, look, so I, uh, when I got out of college, I, I was an investment banker for a little while. I worked for a little bit for a, um, a broker-dealer. You guys, um, they're still out there. Smith Barney? <laughs> it's a funny thing, having been on Wall Street for a little while. I, I was telling Karen this in a meeting not that long ago. Um, when, I, uh, when I was an investment banker, I worked for Bear Stearns. Um, and I helped to raise our first in-house private equity fund. And I remember I was like, I was a young guy, very uh, confident, and I raised one point, I helped to raise $1.2 billion. Um, and I was very proud. I remember going to the closing and being like, wow, $1.2 billion, look at us. <laughs> and I say that in meetings today, and the people around the table look at me and say, oh, $1.2 billion, that's cute. <laughs> like, that's not real money anymore. Anyway, um, when it's I was on It's real money to investors. <laughs> it's real money to investors, for sure. When I, was, um, when I was on Wall Street, there were some pay practices that didn't make any sense, and most of them have gone out the door, but some of them are still in, in the market, and they have no business in our market. You know, the idea that you, have, you get a free vacation if you pitch the right product, the right in-house product, somebody, these things should be ruled out by Reg BI. Uh, Reg BI, does, uh, the proposal does say, and it did at my insistence say, that that kind of um, incentive system is probably not appropriate for retail investors. Um, we should go further and make it clear. Um, I, I don't understand the case for not being clear about the fact that we shouldn't be paying people in a way that creates a conflict that they can't overcome. Um, so those are some of the issues I had with the proposal. Right now, we're working on what I hope will be um, something before the commission to make a final rule sometime soon. Um, but if those things aren't resolved, it's going to be very difficult for me to support it. And I was going to ask you about this sometime soon. We do get the sense that the staff is working really hard to put out the, the final rule in the very near future, or near-ish future, in the next quarter or so. Is that? So I think that's right. Um, I think, so a few things about that. Uh, first of all, I think the shutdown pushed back our agenda somewhat. And I can't overstate um, how proud I am of the staff and the folks um, who have come back to work and really dug in. Um, the effects of a 30-plus of a day shutdown are hard to overstate um, yeah. in, in, in the SEC. And our staff have been tremendous about it. They've come back to work, really dug in. But my sense from them, having spoken to them, is when they got there, they had a, a pretty full inbox. Um, and so I think you're right to, to think about it in the next quarter or so. But my guess is um, that the staff is really going to have to dig in to get to a place where they have something before the commission that, that everyone can... can be satisfied with. And one of the things that we were interested in, and you alluded to it earlier, is investor testing. Mm. And we uh, are concerned that form CRS is really not understood, uh, not understood by investors. And we submitted our own form CRS mock-up as an example, as, as you alluded to. Do you think there is any more investor testing forthcoming, or are we where we are and um, we're going to have to evaluate based on uh, what has been in the public record and you know we would have loved to have seen alternatives tested as well yeah that's a good question i i certainly hope there's more testing coming i mean the rand study um gives us some sense that people had a hard time understanding form crs um i think um you know you can see in the survey results that asking ordinary investors to understand the difference between a 34 act model and a 40 act model a, a bd and an i it's very challenging to get investors to understand that um, and there's some evidence in the RAND study that they struggled with that. Um, so the question is what to do with that evidence. Now, my view is what we should do is try and test some alternatives um, and say, well, what if we just try to explain the BD model by itself and then offer some insight about how those guys get paid and not require a side-by-side, -side, for example? I'd be interested to know how investors would react to that. Um, I think that's something we should test before we make the decision, but, but those decisions get made by the chairman. Yeah, un understood. Um, I'd like to move on to... 
um, proxy voting, mm -hmm. uh, which is an issue that I know both of us are very interested in. The SEC held a roundtable uh, last fall um, talking about proxy plumbing, proxy voting, proxy advisory firms. Um, from our perspective, you know, proxy advisory firms, yes, they're not perfect, but they're very valuable um, third-party service provider for our members, and we really need them to be able to do our jobs, even just from a mechanics standpoint or administrative uh, voting standpoint. What are your thoughts on what the SEC should tackle first um, and what could or needs to be done in the uh, proxy advisory firm area? So, uh, first of all, uh, Karen, for those of you who haven't been following this, Chair Clayton um, really did a tremendous work bringing in a roundtable of folks across the spectrum from all places in the, um, in the investment uh, advisor industry um, to get to hear from the market about what's working and what's not on proxy advisors. And I'm, I'm a guy who takes a look at that market and is very open to the notion that it's not a perfect market. I mean, for one thing, for decades we've had two players in the market. Um, so I think there's work to do, um, but if I'm being candid, my, my own sense is that what we heard from that roundtable is that the much bigger problem is first to get the basic plumbing of a voting in American corporate elections fixed. So there was a major proxy fight not that long ago at Procter & Gamble. Hundreds of millions of dollars of investor money were spent on this fight, and to this day, nobody knows who won. I, I think in the technological world in which we live, that's unacceptable. Um, and I, I've sort of, I've said publicly, and, I, and I'm happy to say today, that to me that's the problem to fix first. Um, I'm happy to have a conversation about proxy advisors. I'm very excited because um, uh, at the recent uh, meeting of the Investor um, Advisory Committee, uh, my colleague Elad Roisman sort of took the reins in this area. Elad is a tremendous, uh, very thoughtful colleague. Um, I'm very excited he's working on it. I think he's going to get into the weeds and tackle these details. He's somebody who really cares about the details of the marketplace. Proxy plumbing is complicated. We issued a concept release on it in, in 2010. It's 400 pages long. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, you know, read it in your leisure time. But, but you get the idea. I mean, it's, it's a Four very... Four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's a really complicated issue. I think he's going to dig into it and focus on it this year. I certainly hope so. Um, and if he does, he'll have my support. One thing in particular that I think we should focus on is what's known as end-to-end -end vote confirmation. So there's a fundamental idea in voting, which is that if I cast a vote in a corporate election, can I get a confirmation that my vote was counted? And if so, how so? Um, Right now, there's no law requiring this, and in fact, getting that confirmation is challenging. Um, I would hope that sometime this year we're going to get to work on that, because that seems like a basic thing that we can do for American investors that'll make a real difference. No, oh, that, that's exactly right. Everyone's vote needs to be counted and confirmed. Yeah. That's a critical function of the, of the system, and, and we are looking forward to working with the commission on, as it considers proxy voting issues going forward, and appreciate your your interest in the subject and your willingness to, to take it on. Yeah, no, I, and like I said, uh, my, my colleague, Commissioner Roisman, um, he's already digging into those details. I really um, think he's going to take a down-the-middle approach to this and just try to do something that helps the marketplace. Whether or not we do something broader on proxy advisors, it's an interesting question. Um, I'm open to that as well. As I suggested earlier, there's a bipartisan bill on the Senate side uh, from Senator Reid on that subject about requiring registration, for example, a little more oversight of conflicts. I'm not against that. Um, and. Uh, I think it's something worth considering. I would say I'd prefer that we do proxy plumbing first because I predict that the, um, the questions around proxy advisors are going to um, be political and harder to resolve. And I wouldn't see why we wouldn't do the easy thing first before we try and do something broader. And it's not unrelated. In other words, some of the conversation about the timing of when issuers get the information from the proxy advisor firms. It's very tight because of the mechanics. So they're not, they're not unrelated. Well, that's right. And I think that solving the first set of questions first, you know, coming up with something like end-to-end -end vote confirmation, um, setting out the timing rules around when people are entitled to information, that could resolve a lot of the questions around proxy advisor services. Yeah. And just to clarify, there were two, there were two bills, one of which would have uh, required proxy advisory firms to register as, as a new and separate entity, sort of like the credit rating agencies. The second bill that Commissioner Jackson is alluding to would require proxy advisor firms to register as investment advisors, and some of them already are. It's a little bit of a different, a different framework. Um, I'd like to um, ask about a related issue. You have testified, or semi-related, you've testified at the Federal Trade Commission mm. about concentration of ownership, and you've um, it, it is uh, related to what a, another professor, John Coates, has called the, 
the, I think, power of 12, mm. although I think 12 is pretty nonspecific, and it's the concept that as um, assets flow to fewer and fewer firms, a small number of people will have control over the votes of all of the companies and industries you know, in America and, and worldwide. And you have called for some greater transparency around proxy voting there. Mm -hmm. What would you like to see happen? So uh, for those of you who haven't been following this debate, there's a sort of a series of academic papers that have made the, an argument that goes like this. Increasingly, it's the case just in the market that we have concentrated ownership of American companies. So if we take the ownership of BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, and State, for many companies and many industries, you can get to 30 plus percent of the common equity. And that's because we have, we have increasingly assets pouring in to indexes, um, and they're accumulating stakes that are significant in this way. The academic literature suggests, it's a paper in the Journal of Finance, suggesting that this has an effect on prices and competition. And the fundamental thesis of this work is that, um, is that the shareholders have an interest in less competition so that they can raise prices on consumers and maximize profits. Now, I'm somebody who, you know, I've done a lot of academic work. I have something in the Journal of Finance myself this year. I don't have, um, I don't think that we have, that that evidence is conclusive. And here's my fundamental problem as a guy who worked in corporate law and who worked on Wall Street. The mechanism for that, like I don't understand fundamentally how we get from BlackRock, Vanguard, and Fidelity owning a lot of shares in a company to increased airline tickets. Like it's hard for me to imagine that they sit in a, I mean, it, it's a, like a felony. Um, and they, you know, they're rich and value their liberty. So I, that's, a, that's a hard hypothesis for me to accept. Um, what, I, what I think is much more likely is that um, what they're observing is something else that they haven't quite put their finger on, and here's my guess about what it is. What's happening fundamentally is that in a corporate election in America, if you convince the four names I just mentioned, you win. And if you don't, you lose. And I think that's actually a problem that's worth talking about. Because fundamentally, I think, to the degree that corporate elections are being swayed one way or the other on the basis of just a few people deciding, as Professor Coates says, whether it's 12 people or 20, the idea that that much power in corporate America is concentrated in such a small place is something we should talk about. What I've said is to the degree that BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanguard, State, et cetera, are casting votes with American investors' money, American investors should understand that at the point of sale. So when you sit down with BlackRock or Fidelity to plan your 401k or your 403b, when you make that investment decision, you should get a piece of paper that tells you these guys tend to vote this way. Whether it's with shareholders or with management, they tend to vote this way, they tend to vote that way. That information should get right in front of you. Now, if BlackRock were sitting here, they would say, yeah, but we do. Uh, we provide it in like a thousand page prospectus. It's on page 800. And I would say that won't do. Um, I think we can do a little better than that. The good news about the data science that we have, um, uh, the technology we have right now, is you can take BlackRock's voting history and give a spatial analysis. This is where they land, and this is where Vanguard lands, and this is where Fidelity lands, this is where State lands. And I just want them to be held accountable for that, because I think if you told the ordinary American investor every corporate election gets decided by those four people and with your money, um, that would surprise them. Uh, and it's something, uh, to the degree that their money is going to get voted, they should really understand the way, the, the way those votes are being cast. I didn't, and fund, and fund um, managers do have to actually disclose their votes, right, under Form N NPX. Yeah, Form NPX. You guys uh, read that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's the poetry that attracts the... <laughs> Look, so I think Form MPX is a good step forward, but I've, I've, I've read them. And getting those data, look, all I'm pushing for is taking the data that we have and making it understandable to the ordinary investor, right? Like, one thing, here's an interesting question. If you took a look at the way ordinary American retail investors vote their shares when they go out and buy shares, like through a BD account, and compare it to the way an institution votes their shares, you think that's going to be very similar? I'm not so sure it would be. Now, the truth is, none of us in the room know the answer. And that right there suggests to me we could do a little better on transparency. So for me, I think what I, what I have suggested to the Division of Investment Management, my view has been, let's take the information we have in MPX and get it in front of investors in a way that helps them understand the way their money is being voted. So that at a minimum, what Coates called the problem of 12, those 12 folks should have some accountability to the people whose money they're voting. Well, we look forward to having the conversation with you about that and, and transparency in the pro proxy voting in that sense and in, in general. Yeah. Um, I'd like to turn to another topic that is near and dear to the hearts of 
uh, I think everyone in the room, and that's cybersecurity and data privacy. Um, obviously, that's been at the forefront of, of everyone's thoughts and minds um, for the last several years. Do you think that there has been uh, sufficient guidance uh, from the commission or other agencies? Do you think that there should be better coordination among agencies with respect to cybersecurity? And then, related somewhat, how is the SEC thinking about the balance between the the vast amount of data that you mm -hmm. collect and the need for, for uh, ensuring that it's not hacked and it remains private. So a few things. Uh, first of all, um, uh, the chairman, Jake Layton, has done extraordinary work on this subject. And when he first came into office, there were a number of issues at the SECs involving Edgar, et cetera, that he has, I mean, it's really been a, an incredible effort to stand up a new office, to, to make sure that we're protecting the data that we take in, Karen. And you're right, that's incredibly important. Not just for the credibility of the agency, it's institutionally important. It's also important to the marketplace, for folks to feel like when data comes into the SEC, it gets protected. But you asked another question about the degree to which we are providing enough guidance to the market on cyber. First of all, let me say that of all the issues I see in my job, this is the one that keeps me up at night. Um, because when I talk to boardrooms, I talk to the marketplace, I talk to people in this room, what I hear is this is a 24-hour day, seven day a week, 365 day a year war. And it's a war actually in my sense is against our lifestyle, right? About the idea that companies can learn more about the American people, what they want, what they need, what they value, and make judgments on the services they provide on the basis of that hard evidence. And it feels like that's under attack. Um, and many of our companies are having to fight that war not on their own, they do have some help from many of the agencies you mentioned, but, uh, or you refer to, but for me, uh, I want to be as constructive as I can in helping American companies protect our way of life. That's the way I look at it. So, um, last year we provided commission level guidance, which reaffirmed previous staff guidance saying, here are the things we expect companies, and in some cases investment advisors, to do with respect to cyber. And we asked for a whole bunch of things, protections against insider trading around the time, of these kinds of things, internal reporting and compliance mechanisms to make sure information on hacks gets to the boardroom when it needs to get there. All those things uh, were things we emphasized in the guidance. I gave a speech a few weeks later, and in the speech I said the following. There's a public database called the Identity Theft Resource Center. I took a look at all the evidence from uh, the hacks in 2017 that occurred at public companies. And one thing you should know, by the way, you probably do, is state and local law often requires the reporting of a hack to the state or to the affected consumer immediately. I took all the evidence on all the hacks of public companies in 2017, and I looked to see how many times a public company filed an 8K, disclosing to investors what had happened. And the answer is they filed an 8K 3% of the time. Yeah. So look, maybe some of the hacks weren't material, maybe those judgments were close. I've been in those boardrooms trying to tell a board you might want to think about disclosing this. Um, I don't know what the optimal level of disclosure is. I'm going to speculate it's more than 3% of the time. Um, and I said at the time, we might need to provide a clearer rule here. And the corporate counsel I talked to said, Rob, when we go into a boardroom and we say, look, this hack has happened, we think there's an issue here, it's very hard for us to push them to disclose because there's no rule that says they have to. There's guidance, but we can always debate materiality in an area like this. So I promised I would update the speech, and just a couple of weeks ago at the Wall Street Journal CIO conference I did, in 2018, uh, they filed 8Ks in response to hacks 10% of the time. And I reported that publicly, and the reaction I got from some people, like a couple of people called me and they're like, hey, improvement. <laughs> really? So I don't think that'll do. I think that world is moving faster than that. Um, and so I push my colleagues, I continue to urge them that we should consider a, a clear bright line 8K rule here. Now that, look, that doesn't mean, I just wanna be clear, none of our 8K rules are especially prescriptive. They allow lots of, you know this, they allow lots of flexibility for what can be said and when. I think we have to be careful about not providing a roadmap for hackers, showing them that a company is under attack, et cetera. Like I'm all for taking the time necessary to learn how many accounts have been compromised, I'm all for that. But we do need to make clear to the market that um, cybersecurity is so important to investors that not providing that disclosure um, it doesn't make a great deal of sense. One more thing on that. There, in the world in which we live, folks, there's not a lot of secrets anymore for better or for worse. If the Identity Theft Resource Center knows you had a hack, the market knows you had a hack. So not providing that disclosure to the market runs the risk that some investors know it and others don't, which means that people are trading on it, and I don't know why we'd be for that. Um, I'm all for people acquiring information and um, providing price discovery, but on cyber, I don't know why we want to encourage trading on that subject. So I've been pushing pretty hard for us to be clearer on that subject, and I hope that we will. Well, one of the things I think are 
audience is, is concerned about, and I'm not asking you to, um, to say we, we can do anything about it today, but I think one of the concerns is there are 12,000 investment advisors, you know, roughly 10,000 of which are small businesses, yeah. right? And they look at the, the threats of, of cyber mm -hmm. hacks, and they look at what the large companies are doing, and they say, wow, the large companies are throwing billions of dollars at yeah. this, and they're still getting hacked. What can we possibly hope to accomplish as a small business? Well, I want to say one thing about that. Um, first of all, we, all of us at the commission, are very sensitive to the costs that a small business face like that. And I think one thing that's been extraordinary, I think Steph Avakian is going to speak with you a little later. She's a tr our tremendous <laughs> director of enforcement. Um, I think one thing that Steph and the team have done really well is they've made clear when people come into us and tell us that they're trying to do the right thing, we don't punish the people who are trying, trying to get these things right. Um, that's not to say I wouldn't prejudge any particular case, but that has been very, very clear and top of mind for both Steph and Steve Peake and her co-director, and I think they've done an incredible job striking that balance. I think we've made clear to the market that we're not in this to punish people just for punishment's sake. What we're in it is to help people do the right thing and protect the American way of life from people who would try and take it from us. Um, and I'm very proud of the work they've done in that area. I think they've struck that balance just right. Well, we, we appreciate that, and I think we have a question from the audience. So Submitted to Sanjay, yes. So, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. great, thanks. Uh, so Commissioner uh, Jackson, so regulations that are aimed at data collection, for example, Form PF, put a heavy burden on firms that are too large to be exempt, but too small to easily absorb the staffing and technology costs. Do you think the Commission's impact analysis fairly address these, these concerns on burden? Good question. Um, so for those of you who didn't hear it in the back, uh, this question's about the degree to which something like Form PF imposes a significant reporting burden on uh, smaller advisors. Um, and I'm very sensitive to this concern. I actually think one thing that's notable about um, what's happened over the years with Form PF is we've improved it. Um, we've made some changes over the years um, to the questions we're asking. And I, my sense from the market is it's become much less check the box. And I think what I want to ask all of you to, to, to come and tell us is to the degree we've made some improvements that have helped, you should tell us that. And to the degree we have more work to do, you should tell us that as well. Um, and what I've heard is that um, the steps that you guys have taken to make sure the questions are more precise, to make sure the data are more standardized have been helpful. Great. If we have more work to do, let's talk about what that is. My concern about Form PF is that um, it imposes a significant cost, and we have not done as much as we can, in my judgment, to make great use of the data. I think the reaction the market is having is what we learn from the data, I mean, we put out a quarterly report, we do what we can with the data, but uh, what we learn from it just doesn't, it's not enough ROI. It doesn't justify the burden that you're putting on, on the marketplace. And I'm not insensitive to that, but my solution to it uh, would be for us to make more innovative use of the information we have. Um, and I've been pushing in that direction for some time at the Commission. Thank you. We appreciate that, and, and we look forward to working with you on it improving Form PF and reducing the burdens of it. Yeah, one of my frustrations in this area has been that many folks, and look, I understand these data are incredibly sensitive, but many folks have pushed very hard to make it very difficult for folks in government to use or access the data. Um, I understand they're sensitive, but to me there's a little bit of an irony in coming in and saying, you guys really shouldn't use this, you should limit the number of people who can see it, you shouldn't pass it around the government, et cetera, and then to come back 10 years later and be like, you guys aren't using this, so get rid of it. <laughs> I mean, I feel like it's one thing or the other. Like, uh, to the degree you think it's not useful, help us make it more useful. Um, but I'm not uh, that keen about, about, um, about efforts to get rid of it, because I think there's a lot we can and should learn from the market about it. Do we have time for we one do. more? We do. I was going to ask, yes. yes. Sanjay, do you uh, have? Can you provide an update on the ETF rule proposal? Oh, ETF rules. So this is another area where I think the staff has, has done a great job. Um, uh, and I, I voted for the proposal. I, look, fundamentally, the way that we were working with ETFs for a long time didn't make a ton of sense. Um, you know, we were doing it on a case-by-case -case basis. We had a lot of decisions that had sort of, in a way, granted a, I don't want to say a monopoly, but a very significant competitive position to one player in the marketplace in a way that the government shouldn't. And I think uh, you get a good sense of how well the commission is working when we take an area like that that really need to be tackled, and we went out and got it. I'm very proud. Uh, of that work. But I said in the statement I made at that meeting um, that there's a product out there that really worries me, um, and it's gear, it's levered ETFs. Um, and I just want to say what worries me about it. 
I have seen the data, I've talked to people in the marketplace, and there's a very risky story that all of us in this room should be aware of, which is that an American retiree gets to be 62, 63, 64, and they're short. They open the envelope and they say, I don't have enough, I'm not ready. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm not as prepared as I should be. And what they decide is, I don't need the S&P 500. I need three times. And so they buy it and hold it on the hypothesis that this is the way to get more gains from the market. But all of you probably know that what happens in a product like that is if you buy and hold it, the beta erosion alone, the fact that it rebalances every day, even if you're right about the market's direction, will take out half your investment. And I think there's a real risk that some of those people are going to open that envelope in 10 years and be outraged that we didn't do a better job of letting them know what they were really getting into in gear ETF. So what I said in that statement, it's my view as of today, is that I'm happy to be supportive of change in this area, but we have got to do something to keep those products out of the portfolios of ordinary American investors. Nobody, and I mean nobody, thinks that that's a good buy and hold product. It's very useful for day-to-day -day hedging. It's very useful for diversification. I'm all for that. Um, and of course, I should say that I don't speak for the commission, et cetera, although I fully expect that in, you know, given time and wisdom, they'll see that I was right all along. <laughs> But I've taken the view that, guys, in my view, for this marketplace, for the people in this room, nobody should want an American retiree in a levered ETF on a buy and hold basis. Nobody should want that. You don't want that asset class to get painted with that brush. And that's why I'm working hard with IM and my colleagues at the commission to try and get a rule that, that protects investors from that risk. Well, thank you. I think we've run out of time. We really appreciate your willingness to share your insights with the investment advisor community. We appreciate your willingness to engage in outreach with key stakeholders on a wide range of issues, and thank you for your leadership. Oh, thanks so much. Please join me in thanking Commissioner Jackson.